Thank you for being here this afternoon. Uh, I am Assistant National Legislative Director Marquis Bearfield, and it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, a uh, good friend of DAV, uh, Mr. Mike Fisher, the Chief Officer of the Department of Veterans Affairs Readjustment Counseling Service, better known as the Vet Center Program. Since 2016, Mike has led an important program, or led this important program, and provides oversight for the VA's 300 vet centers located throughout the United States, including the District of Columbia, Puerto Rico, the U.S. Virgin Islands, Guam, American Samoa, as well as a fleet of over 83 mobile vet centers and the Vet Center Call Center. Mike began his career with the VA as an outreach specialist at the Baltimore Vet Center. Prior to his career, to his VA career, he served more than 10 years with the Pennsylvania National Guard and was deployed to Iraq as an infantry non-commissioned officer in 2005. Following his combat deployment, he was medically discharged from the military. Mr. Fisher holds a Master of Social Work from the Catholic University of America. Earlier this year, Mr. Fisher was selected and awarded a DAV Special Recognition Award, which recognized him as a trusted source and someone who regularly consults with the DAV and other veteran service organizations on the status and needs of the vet center programs around the country. He has also worked with VSOs to help improve legislation to strengthen the Vet Center program and continuously demonstrates his commitment to veterans and family members who, who have served and in these facilities on a daily basis. By the way, if you haven't noticed while you were here at convention, one of the mobile Vet Centers is here and is available for you to come and talk to the readjustment counselors that are providing services that are needed. Let's give a warm DAV welcome to Mr. Mike Fisher, the Chief Officer of VA's Readjustment Counseling Services. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. All right. So first I want to do, I, I want to start and thank the National Commander, Andy Marshall, the National Adjutant, Mark Burgess, National Legislative Director Joy Elam and the Executive Director Randy Reese for allowing us the opportunity to come and talk to you today a little bit about vet centers. I'm gonna move around a little bit. One of the, so for those of you who aren't familiar with vet centers, we are a organization in the Veterans Health Administration that provides counseling to eligible active duty service members, veterans, uh, but we're a little unique in other places in VA. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that uniqueness. Now, one of the things I always start off with in talking when I, when I give these kind of presentations, and it's something about my bio that, I, that it's not written, and that is I am here today because a vet center counselor wouldn't let me shut his barracks room door on him until I actually went and talked to him. In my time, when all I wanted to do was say no, he helped me say yes. And I submit to you, that is what we do at Vet Centers every day. We help people say yes whenever they're, when every fiber of their being wants to say no. Now, I'm going to use a non-social worky term, and that is we are aggressive when we do that. And what I mean by aggressive, I don't think it's enough to say, here's a phone number, call when you're ready. Because I think when we do that, we've given that person a reason to say no. Rather, here's our phone number, but we're going to call you. We're going to be there for you. In some cases, we're going to force you to come and talk to us. You know, that was the best thing that I've ever done. And that's usually what we hear after, uh, after that statement. They forced me, and it was the best thing I've ever done. So as you can see on the slides, we're going to talk a little bit today about what, how we provide services, our approach. And then we're going to finish the day talking about and actually hearing from some of the veterans and service members that get services at vet centers. And the reason we're going to do this is twofold. I'm going to use this as an outreach event because I'm sure someone in this audience might be interested in, in going to talk to somebody. The other side of that is we're going to ask for your help to get the word out about vet centers, to get to our local vet centers and partner and connect with them on outreach events or other opportunities where we can get veterans and service members engaged into services. Sound good? All right, so history about our organization. We were created in 1979 because the VA, with a lot of help from Congress, 
and I actually see some familiar faces here, helped VA recognize that the Vietnam combat veteran was not coming into VA for services. In fact, through a course of studies called the readjustment studies, they found that trust, quality of services might have been some of the reasons why those individuals who served in Vietnam were not coming into VA. Now, I know there's probably people in this room right now that have experienced that or maybe know someone that experienced that firsthand. Well, either way, they created vet centers, separate from VA medical centers, staffed by fellow Vietnam combat veterans. In fact, this was the beginning of the peer-to-peer -peer model in VA. I'm actually the typical vet center employee, served first, then was able to get back and, and continue that mission after I got my degrees. So our role was to go out and find everyone who served in Vietnam and make them comfortable with the idea of using VA, VA services. We were designed to do that by providing direct services or counseling, outreach, and then care coordination or referral. Now, the interesting thing in the beginning is that we were never meant to last more than a year or two. In fact, the thinking at the time was that we would go out, find everyone who served in Vietnam, and everything would become amazing. Well, we know that's not how the world works, especially with populations that are looking for reasons to say no. I know that's what it was for me. So rather, our focus is going out and creating relationships. And then from those relationships, when an individual is comfortable, let's get them out to other places. Our mission statement on this slide. One of the most important words in that mission statement is the idea of community. And this is something we actually borrow from Native American tradition, which says it is your community that sends you to war. It is then your community's responsibility to welcome you home and to begin to give your experience meaning. And for us, our goal is to help find whatever experience you're looking for. It could be access to benefits. It could also be dealing with a year of hell and try to make heads or tails of what happened or what's going on. And, that's the, and then also, we see our role as rallying the entire community together to welcome home those who serve. And that's the community partnership component of what we do. And we're going to talk a little bit about that today because that's really where we're going to have some asks for everyone in the audience. Our eligibility is a little bit different than other places in VA. For us, it does not matter where you are in your journey. If you're an active duty service member, if you're a veteran, if you're a member of the National Guard or Reserve, if you served in a dangerous place, if you experienced a certain kind of trauma, like military sexual trauma, you can come into a vet center now and for the rest of your life. Our eligibility is really about service in a dangerous place or experiencing those certain kinds of trauma. Now, we're not going to go through each one of our eligibilities. In fact, there'll be a QR code at the end of the presentation, and you can get your cell phone out, and it'll take you to our website where you can take a look at all of those things. What I do want to talk about is something that we do, and that is anyone who walks into a vet center will not be turned away. If you truly are ineligible for our services, our role is to help find places where we can make that referral to. And there's a couple of reasons why we do that. The first reason is because we don't want someone to leave in crisis. The other reason is that we're looking for ways to qualify an individual, not disqualify them. You know, I think in life, like in counseling, we're all trying to get two questions answered. Do you care about me and can I trust you? It's why when many of the veterans and service members come into vet centers, the first thing they talk about is benefits. Because what we really see from the benefits question is, I don't know if, if you care about me. I don't know if I can trust you yet, counselor. I don't know if I'm into this idea of talking to somebody. So we're going to throw you a softball. And if you do a good job with that, I will let you into things, or I might let you into things that I'm not willing to wear, or I'm not willing to talk about, or I don't wear on my sleeve, like military sexual trauma. Or maybe I don't consider myself a combat veteran because I never left the wire. So our focus is helping qualify, find ways to qualify individual, not disqualify them. The other thing that makes us unique is that you don't have to enroll in VHA healthcare, though we want to help you do that. You also, we don't require service connection, we don't means test. We, and this goes all back to the, being that safe place to begin that journey. We also provide services regardless of discharge status. That includes dishonorable discharges. Now, this is another place where we'll need help, and that is, our role in dishonorable discharge is to help connect individuals to begin the discharge upgrade process. And we need veteran service organizations or partner with veteran service organizations to start to help with that. Our approach. Now, if any of you are familiar with vet centers, you might see some different language 
on the slides some different graphics. This is actually a large effort that we've taken on over the past couple of years to rebrand us. And by rebranding, what we did was we went out and talked to veterans and talked to service members and talked about what language means is important to you. Why is that important to you? And that's where we came up with what you see on the slides here and really getting into this idea of connection, camaraderie, and community. And that really is the focus of our, of our locations, our vet centers. Connection. We're able to create veteran-to-veteran -veteran connections. And that's part because a large percentage of our staff are veterans, about 70% right now, with the majority being combat veterans. It's that idea of, you don't have to explain to me what an IED is. I know firsthand what an IED is. So we're able to make that instant connection. We're also, in this idea of connection, it's able to, to meet that veteran, that service member, wherever they are in their journey, putting them in the driver's seat of their care. Our focus is really about helping you set a goal, create a support structure around yourselves to accomplish the goal, and then when you accomplish that, set another goal. And it's this idea of doing that, over, the lifelong process of doing that over and over again. The idea of camaraderie. Really what this is, it's about creating that support structure around yourself to accomplish goals. We might be able to do that through the family services we provide. And when we say family services, it really is meant to whatever the goals of that veteran service member are, to help them through those goals. We take a very wide definition of what uh, family is. It's up to that veteran, that service member, to define that. The other side of that is as we create that camaraderie, what we're really looking at doing is getting that veteran, that service member, engaged in other kind of services, whether that is at the VA as a whole, whether that is within the vet center itself to other, uh, other groups or those kind of things we do, and that's where we get into this idea of community and that is bringing everyone together in shared experiences. We're also known for reducing barriers to care, whether that is non-traditional hours, whether that is virtual services, something that the pandemic has helped us with. Also confidentiality, and this is something that we're really proud of. The only people who know you're coming into a vet center are the people you tell, the people you allow to know through a signed release of information, or if there's a serious attempt to harm yourself or somebody else, we will break confidentiality for that. Also, we're known for community partnership. And the idea is that we want to understand whatever the needs of are of that community and be able to meet those needs. That could mean bringing a veteran service organization into the vet center to have office hours, to help out with claims issues. It could be having a lawyer come in and do pro bono work. It could be partnering with an equine therapist, but we want to become that one-stop shop for whatever the readjustment needs are in that particular community. We're going to talk a little bit about expansion of services in a little bit, and this is where I want to get into where we're going to need your help. I want to start doing that by talking and, and showing you some examples of where we were able to partner with you whether that is out of our Shreveport, our Shreveport Vet Center, Annapolis, or even in Santa Fe, our partnerships with the community are what allow us to do what we do, whether that is an outreach event or being able to create bi-directional referrals. That's really what this is all about for us. Being able to help, I don't use the, use the word force, but to help people, individuals come in when they're not yet ready to say yes. We've talked a bunch about the what we do. We do individual group marriage family counseling, but we take a different approach to that. We're not a medical model. We don't diagnose. We don't focus on diagnosis. Rather, we focus on the symptoms associated with that diagnosis. And the reason we don't do that is because we believe there's a stigma. There could be a potential stigma with diagnosis. We don't have to worry about those kind of things. It really is about helping that veteran, that service member, set whatever goal they might have create that support structure, and then allow them to accomplish that goal. We also take, uh, you know, some circles in VA call it non-traditional modalities. These are things that we do every day, whether that's gardening groups, outdoor activities. It could be mindfulness or yoga. It really is ways to keep that veteran, that service member engaged in services. You know, when we talk about suicide reduction, that is 
one of the best ways to reduce suicide is to keep individuals engaged in services, to create a therapeutic relationship where if I'm having a bad day, I trust that I can tell somebody I'm having a bad day and that they're going to do something with that. So our services are provided at 300 locations across the country. In addition to that, what we have what we call Vet Center Outstations and Vet Center Community Access Points. An outstation is where we assign a, at least one counselor into a distant community, maybe like St. Thomas or St. Croix on the U.S. Virgin Islands. We also have community access points where we borrow space in a location that's distant from one of our locations and provide services anywhere from once a month to a couple of times a week. This is a place where we can ask, where we're going to ask for some help. We have about 1,000 community access points right now across the country. We have not been able to provide services at some of them because of the pandemic, and now as we move from that, we're going to start uh, going back to those locations. But there might be opportunities if we can come to your locations to be able to connect with veterans and service members uh, and provide direct services to them. This is actually how we're going to expand as an organization. We actually start with a community access point. As more veterans start coming in, then we'll create an outstation there, and then ultimately a new vet center. And we get a lot of questions about how do we get a vet center into my community. That's how we do it. We start with this local partnership and then begin to start providing services. This slide here just talks about numbers, what we've been able to do. I think the most important thing is this, the bottom two numbers. We're seeing expansion right now into the members of the National Guard. We're seeing more and more women veterans coming in, which is something that we're really excited about. Now, we've talked a bunch about what we do and why we do it. We're actually going to spend the rest of our time talking about from the experience of that veteran or service member. And this is, we're going to do that through our customer feedback. It's a project that we took on about a year ago. Many of you who use VA services have probably received a similar survey at the VA Medical Center, maybe at the Vet Center. And what we're able to, what we're able to know from that is that 93% of those respond would recommend a vet center, or trust vet centers, rather, to meet their needs. It's something we're very excited about. That number has actually held strong over this past year, and I think it is a testament to the work that we're doing at our local, our local vet centers. And as you can see down through the different numbers on this slide, that veterans out there trust us to do the work. We're able to schedule appointments when they need to. We're in communities where, where they believe we need to be. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about all of the stuff and bring, bring everything that we've talked about together by actually talking about a veteran experience. I'm going to introduce you into Brian. Brian is a Marine Corps veteran, multiple tours, Afghanistan, was in some explosions, uh, came home, tried to engage in services. He maybe lasted one or two sessions. Uh, sound familiar? He then took some time off from getting services. And in that time, he quit his job, he left school, he started experiencing seizures, and was just really having a very difficult time. Fortunately enough, he was able to connect back with a vet center about seven years later. And it was a slow process. It began with connection. It started off slowly with individual counseling, building up that therapeutic relationship, had, making sure that there was some consistency there, that he was completely bought into the idea of going into counseling, which we know is not easy. It then shifted into expanding to additional services where he was able to not only participate in vet center groups, but get a little outside the vet center. Was able to participate in a hiking group with other veterans. And then from there, was able to move into participating actively with veteran service organizations. He's traveling with his family now and thinking about the future. I think what's very exciting about this is that the symptoms that he was experiencing are reducing. And it was because he committed into those services. The next couple of slides will actually talk about the customer feedback that we're getting. And the reason why we put this up here, and this particular, this particular, uh, oops, this particular statement here, what's important to me is I see about, I, what I really hear in this statement is about choice. Who is that veteran, who's that service member gonna create a therapeutic relationship when they come into a vet center? They wanna talk to a female, they wanna talk to a male, a combat veteran, a non-combat veteran. 
And if we don't get it right the first time, we're going to try again until we do get it right. And as you can see, she was able to make that connection here and from that connection continue services. The next slide or two, we're actually going to talk about the experience from a Vietnam veteran or Vietnam veterans. And what's, what I really see here is in, oops, in this particular one, this individual started services in 92. This individual is just connecting into services. And I think what's important here is that it doesn't matter when you come into a vet center. If you come into a vet center today, tomorrow, 30 years from now, or the entire 30 years, we're here for you. And be able to connect, create that community. And it's not about, here's 12 sessions of, of some evidence-based modality. It could be that, but it doesn't have to be about that. It's about putting that veteran, that service member, in the driver's seat of their care and allowing them to, make, to, to help make decisions, to set goals and create support structures around yourself to accomplish those goals and then accomplish them. This here is a quote from one of our recent returning Afghanistan veterans. And we also have one from one of our Iraq veterans. What's important to, at least me, when I read these statements is that, oops, it's about connecting into services. That's not easy. It's about taking that, that first step. And this is where we have to get aggressive, especially with our recently returning veterans who are thinking about what is my life going to be? I'm not ready yet to talk to somebody. And then lastly, here's a quote from one of our Gold Star mothers. We do provide bereavement counseling. And I think this, what's very important here is this idea that we're there for families as well. And that doesn't stop with the passing of a veteran or the passing of an active duty service member. And actually, we're going to open it up. We have a video that we'd like to show everybody. And if that can be queued up. Vet Center saved me, saved my life. The first time I realized that something was wrong was at my first duty assignment. To even say PTSD for an event that's not wartime was just blowing my mind. So the first time they told me I could possibly have had PTSD and military sexual trauma, I was confused. I experienced immeasurable amount of guilt. I didn't want to go through the agony. I didn't want to go through the pain. I didn't want to feel the hurt. I didn't want to cry. If you ever want to take control of you, and these feelings that plague and torment us, then come to the vet center. I found myself really struggling uh, in 2012 after my last deployment to Afghanistan. While I was in Afghanistan, I had made plans, things I would do, and then when I returned home, I just laid on the couch. I finally got to the point where I realized I needed help. It was like a night and day environment, the differences between being at the vet center. Every week, just by talking to other people, you get more insights into your own psyche. It's been years I've been coming here and I've built up a lot of skills to help me cope. With the way that I received help from the Bed Center started out with marriage counseling. It got our foot in the door. It got us to see what's available. The center provides us with a lot of socialization. In addition to just the counseling, there's a lot of activities. There's a parties, there's barbecues, there are field trips that we could sign up for, and it's good to feel like we're not alone and that the people we're dealing with understand what it's like to be the military. It's like coming home. It was devastating to come back from Vietnam, but there's nothing like walking into a vet center and being accepted for who and what you are. Walking into a vet center, being able to talk to a therapist that has served themselves or others that have served themselves, you know, you, you gain that trust. Nothing is that you talk about with a therapist or with a group is talked about outside those doors. That's between you and the person you talked with. The counselors are there to help you, not hurt you. It's good to have those tools to be able to come back to zero instead of being at 100. The vet center is here. It's a lifesaver. It really is. Okay, 
So we're gonna, this is where we're going to wrap up today. This is our QR code, so anyone who wants to check out more information about our services, uh, please click on that. You also see our website listed here. And I, this goes back to the ask. The ask is getting in touch with our local vet centers and seeing if there's ways we can partner, whether that is bringing a veteran service officer into one of our locations. Maybe it's finding out about some events that you have coming up where we can bring our mobile vet center. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at it, it's right outside. Or maybe just setting up a table like is also right outside this door where we have staff. And we can do a couple of things. We don't have to just come in and talk about benefits. We can bring counselors that if anyone wants to talk to a counselor, we can do that at that point. As well as maybe there's some potential for creating community access points or helping us understand if there's pockets of veterans that just aren't getting services yet that we can go out and connect with through our outreach or direct services. So I'm gonna stop there and see if there's any questions uh, or comments or anything that we can do to be helpful. There's two microphones, one on either side. Yes, sir. Hello, I'm Bruce Nogar, Arizona Department, Junior Vice and a Hospital Service Coordinator. Got two quick questions. Do you guys actually write claims for vets and submit them to the VA? Sure, so the question is do we, do we write claims? Write claims, yeah. We do not write claims. Rather, our focus is to partner with the, the subject matter experts that do that work. Whether that is a veteran service officer we also have in some places have, have staff from VBA or the Benefits Administration to come in and help with that. And then it's about making connections where we might have veterans or service members that could benefit from the work that you're doing, as well as you might want to refer some veterans or service members into services. Cool. So and our then, job is to really to make connections. And then any of the documentation that you do as far as mental uh, claims, is that uh, can be used as evidence in a mental claim? Yeah, absolutely. So the question has to do with the documentation that's kept at vet centers. So there are records that kept. It talks about the work that happens within the group sessions, the, the individual sessions, and it's up to that veteran or service member, whatever they like to do with that. Many of those individuals actually use that as part of their claims. And we also write treatment uh, summaries or counseling summaries that will also talk about the services or the work that that particular veteran and family have gone through. Yes, sir. Sam Phillips, uh, chapter 169. Yes, sir. Victoria, Texas, veteran service officer. Okay, uh, we have informally established a uh, quasi, I guess, vet center and we've partnered with some other organizations, peer-to-peer -peer and so forth, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get that established. The county has worked with us. We feel pretty good about our system. We'd like to be able to talk more about your system to see if this can be something that would benefit our veterans in the Victoria area. How will I get that started? Yeah, so I, what I'd like to do is we actually have two staff here in the front Ed and Jessica, they're part of our communications team. We wanna get your information and then we will connect you to your local vet center, to those staff so they can begin discussion about you know, what we can do together. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna go over here, sir. Tim Butts, Department of Nebraska. I'm yes, sir. A service officer and I work out of the Omaha Vet Center. And I wanna tell my comrades that if you have a chance to partner with the local vet center, it's very, very good. I'm provided with everything I need in order to do my job. Uh, the staff is very friendly. I get a lot of referrals from the staff. And when I, the first month that I was there, I was there only on one day, actually a half day a week. And that has grown to the point where I'm there every day of the week. Um, that's the kind of volume that you will eventually get out of that. You have to be patient as word circulates that you're there. More people are going to come in, but veterans have a good way of letting know what works. And uh, so I really encourage you to, to foster some kind of relationship. It's been very beneficial for us. I'm, I'm seeing 60 veterans a month, mm -hmm. and uh, that's not a small number. 
Thank you very much for that. I think that really speaks to the value of what our partnerships can do. And I think what's important to us, it's all about bi-directional referrals. You know, we can't fix a broken foot at the vet center, but we know who can. And being able to make those connection points where an individual then feels comfortable to be able to, to shift over to the VA Medical Center, I think is very valuable. Yes, sir. Terry Scow from Ogden, Utah. I wanted yes, to uh, put in a plug for your Ogden Vet Center and in particular, Candace Monson. We had a Vietnam vet who had applied for PTSD, turned him down. I got him connected with Candace. Candace did a workup. We submitted that honors claim. But just great work and great rapport, and uh, wanted to put that plug in for yeah. her. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I also want to thank you, sir. So Terry actually sits on our advisory committee for the readjustment of veterans. It's a group that actually helps us understand what's happening out in the environment, and then they make recommendations for things that we in Vet Center should be thinking about. So thank you for participating in that, and thank you for everything that you're doing in Utah. Oh, I'm sorry. No worries. Yes. Um, Thank you for that, by the way. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm very short. Uh, no, it's the lights on my uh, side. Uh, Shamla Kapizi. I am the senior vice uh, commander for Arlington, Virginia, which is chapter 10. I'm also a national service officer apprentice out of Washington, D.C. I think the, the, vet, vet, uh, the vet centers are really like the best kept secret, and we do refer a lot of veterans out. Um, the issue is I did have a veteran come across that was filing for uh, mental health, but he did contact uh, the local vet center and he was turned away um, and was referred to a nonprofit out in town. So what happened was he ended up trying to get services. He's turned away from the vet center and then now he's getting services, but they told him he's gonna have to pay an, um, a copay. And so is when you're talking about referral, is that what you're meaning and like community base or mm -hmm. just define, I guess, just define sure, referral? Sure, sure. So first, thank you for that. Cause there's a couple of things I wanted, I want to talk about when I answer that. And I'm going to have to hit to the other side of the stage to do this. I'm going to flip the slide and on that is going to be contact information for us. So if you experience challenges, we want to know about them right away. So we can go and then ask questions and begin to correct those things. Now, I think we're gonna to need to talk offline about the specific issues to be able to get an understanding of what happened in that particular case. It could be an eligibility thing or that, or, or it could be something else. But what we don't wanna do is if an individual is eligible, turn them away. So we can talk offline about that and, and, and be able to figure out what's going on. But I think the important thing for us is about it's about service recovery. It's about making sure that if we did something incorrect, we want to fix it right away. So thank you for bringing that up. And I believe over here, and then we'll come down into the center. Uh, Tim Walsh, Chapter 1, Department of South Dakota. Yes. Uh, I'd just like to thank you. I did get my initial help at the vet center, so I want to do that. But I, I, I just had a question. I deal with taking veterans to the vet center for appointments who don't have uh, transportation, whatnot. I just wanted if the vet center tracks, like I had a particular individual, if you lose somebody, you know, that initially makes contact and then it might be a year or two, five year deal down the road where they come back. I guess in an instance, I had an individual that was enrolled in a veteran that was enrolled in a six week self-development program. Mm -hmm. And week one, I uh, gave the veteran a ride to the vet center and she's very excited positive, upbeat, and then kind of lost her weeks two, three, four, and then reached out to her, and she came back week five, but it was, you know, I wondered if the vet center tracks, or there's a way of tracking who we're losing, and then when they're coming back, and percentages of stuff like that. Yes, and, and that is something that does happen at, at the local vet center, and what really comes to my mind with what you're talking about and, and where, like, where, I, where our counselors focus is to, is to connect with those individuals on a reoccurring basis to find out what's going on and then to welcome them back in. Now, some people are just make the decision that I don't, I'm not ready yet. Exactly. And you know, we, that, that's a reality, but our focus and what we do at our locations is connecting with those individuals 
on a reoccurring basis to make sure that, you know, we didn't miss something. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Hi, Mark Graham, Chapter 11 out of uh, New, uh, Clearwater. I work at one of the vet centers, and uh, just before I started working there, my counterpart, they had come in and put in a new IT system, new, new computer and new scanner and everything else, and the problem is he doesn't have access to it. I don't have access to it, so what, what I do is I have my own printer, my own computer. I do have the internet, so I, I do my own printing, my own scanning, my own faxing, my own emailing. He has to go back and forth with the director, whoever's there, and if the director's busy, one of the counselors, and if the counselors are all busy, the veterans have to wait until we figure something out. Can there not be some consistency that if, vet, if the service officers are going to be there, then provide them with equipment they can use solely for themselves mm -hmm. to be able to service the veterans easier? Because I, I may manage to do it because I bring my own equipment. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be that complicated, I would think. Yeah, you know, especially when you bring up like faxing and those kind of things, that's something, let's take that one offline and let's take a look at that one. Uh, computers, well, well, let's take a look at it. But I, I think there should be something we should be able to do with faxing and printing and things like that. I mean, that just makes sense. Yeah. We want to be good partners. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bob Carnegie from Northwest Indiana. Uh, the vet center that is nearest to us falls under Jesse Brown. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work as the DAV with some of the National Guardsmen in our area. Those that are still active have a terrible time wanting to go to the VA for obvious reasons, because if they want to be continuing on in their careers with the National Guard, quite often information can get to the National Guard. I've tried to encourage them that at the vet center it's different. Can mm -hmm. you help me? So that those soldiers know that if they come to the vet center, it's a whole different program than going to the clinic yes. or going to Jesse Brown. So there's a couple of things here, and actually I'm glad you brought up National Guard. There's been an expansion of our services to more individuals in the National Guard. And, and if they don't meet our normal eligibility or, or our existing eligibility, like combat zone, area of hostility, and those kind of things, if they've experienced any kind of trauma or behavioral challenge related to their military experience or military service, they can come into a vet center. And I think really where our focus needs to be is how do we get you connected to your local vet center? And then how do we together get connected to the National Guard? Now we have relationships with the National Guard where we go out to their drilling weekends and things like that. But if you have a better way of us connecting, then we wanna make sure we're connecting those dots. Right, but, but my point is they're fearful of talking because of the connection with yeah. the clinic or the hospital. This is where, where it's so important and it's something I call the 15 call rule. You have to hear something 15 times for it to sink in. Uh, it's why if I say it's time to make the donuts, you might know I'm talking about Dunkin' Donuts. I'm gonna see who regionally who knows that, right? But I, I think our focus when it comes to that is going out and meeting with those individuals over and over and over again until we can build that trust so they know that, yeah, we do care about, we do care about what, whatever their concerns might be. So to accomplish that, the concern that you brought up, we're just gonna have to keep engaging with those individuals over and over again and creating those pathways into services. Okay, and that's so why we have outreach staff. So that's given me an idea on how to go to them sometimes yes. as opposed to the other way around. Exactly. And so one of the things that we have at every vet center is some outreach, yep. is outreach of some kind. Now I was in the infantry, we have mechanized outreach, which is our mobile vet center outside. So if you get a chance, take a look at that. We also have straight leg outreach, which yeah, is right. just going out and participating sure. in events. So out, their job is to go out and to make those face-to-face -face connections over and over and over again. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Ronnie Maybe, uh, Department of Connecticut, uh, State Commander. I'm standing before you as an as a advocate for um, vet centers. I am a part of a vet center myself. Um, I applaud each and every one of you to refer um, people from your state to the vet centers. It's a great place to network with other individuals that served during um, your combat or non-combat period. I'll give you still what happened to me. Uh, I was able to uh, authenticate my case by going to a vet center because other veterans were using that facility. I had to do a statement of fact, and I was able to meet a 
federal um, soldier, veteran, a comrade that served with me during, the, during Iraq, and I was able to substantiate my case. It's a great place for, um, for, for therapy. They provide therapy workshops there. So I'm just a strong advocate, and I advise each and everyone that's in this building here for the 100 uh, convention to visit your vet center. Great place to be. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. And thank you for sharing your own story. Anyone else? Oh, yes, ma'am. Um, I'm Jane Bolton. I'm whatever in Tennessee anybody <laughs> needs. Um, I joined the state of California in, um, as a Veterans Outreach Project Specialist in 1977 and got to be in the privilege of helping to lobby for the vet centers and um, got to go to a lot of vet center openings in the state of California. Um, missed the pool tables. <laughs> we, we started in pool halls. So, um, But I, I want to say, um, of all the years the vet centers have been around, they have always been the best kept secret. And I continually go to the Nashville VA, and um, I'll tell my, my primary care is a CBOC now. And I go there, I go to a psychiatrist on the bay, on the campus and everything. Nobody knows the vet center. And I don't understand why. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, I'm learning that there's a problem between the, the people at the VA, the psychiatrists and psychologists. I got a great psychiatrist. The psych psychologists there can, um, it, moving on, the vet center has the best counselors because they've been there. And Dan Edwards was in mm -hmm. there. He, he's awesome. He's helped me a lot in a lot of doing the women veterans groups, the MST groups and everything. And um, it, it, it does appear maybe there's a light that the VA is going to start promoting the vet centers. Um, I'm not ever looking forward to them to ever paying to send people to the vet centers, but um, it, it's one of the most outstanding programs mm -hmm. that most people don't know. So first, a big thank you for everything that you did to help us in the 70s. Now, there are still a couple of vet centers with pool tables, uh, and that, yes, that, that does exist, and I think that really talks to the idea of creating community. Now, the other side about being the best kept secret, and this is something that's a challenge I like to pass on to everyone. And that is, if you know someone, tell them about vet centers. And that's how we become, or that's how we move away from this idea of being the best kept secret. It's making sure our outreach staff are going out and creating those opportunities where we can have conversations. Now we're gonna have to have those conversations over and over again, especially with populations that are looking for reasons to say no. I'm not ready yet to hear that. My wife might be ready to hear that and she might tell me what to do, which is fine. But we have to do that over and over again. The other thing that we're focusing on, this is at a national level, something that you talked about at the end, which is connection to our VA Medical Center partners. And that is making sure that we have great relationships. And really what a great relationship is, it's about bi-directional referrals. It's about being able to connect an individual who might have that broken foot or could benefit from services at the VA Medical Center. We've got places with great relationships. We have some other places where we need to improve that relationship. And that's, that's something that we're taking on on our side as well as on the VA Medical Center side. So I actually, I see our time is up. And sir, we can get with you offline and be able to, to talk about you. Oh, actually, let's, sir, if you wanna, we'll do one more. Go ahead. Uh, Ray Ariola, Chapter 20, Fort Worth, Texas, thank you. Yes, sir. My question is, or my comment is, how does the Vet Center work with Camp Hope? Camp Hope. Camp Hope, PTSD that facility. Yeah, that is something that we, we, let's take off, if we can take that one offline and we can see what we're doing locally. And if there's something we need to do to get you connected to our local vet center, because we don't know about something yet, then let's do that and we can, we can make that partnership happen. Sure. Okay. Well, I do want to thank everyone's uh, time today, or allowing us to come in and, and spend a little bit of time together. Uh, once again, our contact information was up there. Uh, so please uh, check out your local vet center and thank you everybody. Thank you.